What's up, guys? Welcome to Christ the King Online. It feels as though we are in a bit of a time machine, and of that point, I will bring some insight in just a moment. But go ahead and do this for me. Open up to the Gospel of Luke. We are continuing a series of messages through the Gospel of Luke. If you're unfamiliar with your Bible, that's totally okay. Right there in the first few pages, you will find an index. There is both an Old and New Testament uh, to what we know as the inspired and infallible Word of God. We are in the New Testament portion right there in the very beginning. There are four Gospels. We are in the Gospel according to Luke. We're going to be in chapter 2, that's the big number 2, and we're going to begin in verse 1, that is the little number 1. And so while you are finding that, allow me to explain a little bit as to why we are meeting like this again. Um, First off, we have had a great time meeting together with God's people and all of our visiting friends from throughout the community on Sunday morning at our new location where I find myself now, I'll get to that in just a minute, at 401 Maple Street. We're meeting at 9 and 1115. Both services are being offered with, um, with plenty of space and distance to be observed by those present. We are continuing to encourage, strongly encourage. We are just south of mandating masks to be worn as you enter as we sing and as you depart we will be placing added emphasis on our six feet of separation as we seem to be seeing cases rise in our community again again we're praying that um, this thing will wind to a close um, sooner rather than later but we're grateful for the opportunity to provide and produce content during this season Because of the season in which we find ourselves, we said, hey, we need to do a really amazing job at providing material for God's people who are not able to meet, whether they are in a period of self-isolation or they find themselves, as perhaps you do, as immune compromised and you are staying away, which we totally support, which we're totally okay with. We love you and we appreciate you from where you are. We wanted to provide something for you to come around on Sunday morning. It was taking us a little bit of time to get those messages put together and put out. So yeah, this is what we're doing now. We are um, here. I am here again alone on a Saturday in our new space. Um, And so hopefully this is finding you on Sunday morning or wherever and whenever you are watching this. Um, That's why we're here. That's why you're finding this right now. So do us a favor. Share this with a friend. We're trying to increase our gospel footprint here in Carrollton. We desire to make, train, and send disciples to engage our neighbors and nations. This is one way that we're able to leverage, leverage technology for that end and so um share this with a friend share it on your facebook share the link email it out annoy your friends we are totally supportive of annoying your friends um with um with these messages so um luke chapter 2 that is where we are last week will sexton was able to close out chapter one for us while myself and my family were away at the beach incredible week of relaxation and reading um, and and fun and fun with the family and so i'm excited to be back here with you guys tomorrow or again Sunday, right? Whenever. Um, but, but yeah, excited to be back and excited to be transitioning into chapter two. Last week, Will focused on the birth of John and the prophecy of Zechariah this morning or this afternoon, this evening, whenever. It takes some getting used to. You're watching this. Um, we are going to be focusing on the birth of Jesus before in coming weeks, coming around his presentation at the temple, followed by his activity in Jerusalem for Passover as a 12-year-old. And so you should be with me now in Luke chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 1, and and we are going to be reading through verse 21. So Luke chapter 2, verse 1, reading through verse 21. Luke writes this, In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. The first registration took place while Quirinius was governor in Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of and family line of David to be registered along with Mary who was engaged to him and was pregnant 
while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him snugly in cloth and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no room for them at the lodging place. In the same regions, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were, naturally, this is a common theme that we are observing through Luke's gospel, terrified. But the angel said to them, again another common theme, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today a Savior who is Messiah the Lord was born for you in the city of David. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and lying in a feeding trough. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and in peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the feeding trough. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all things, all these things, in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned to glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard just as they had been told. When the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. Holy cow, we've got a lot to work through together over the next few minutes. Have you ever heard the following saying? The devil is in the details. Perhaps you're even familiar with this saying. What you may not know is that this is a proverb most often attributed to a German-American architect, which translates more accurately from the original, God is in the detail. And that's what we're going to spend a large amount of our time focusing on this morning. I don't know how the focus shifted, but the substance is widely accepted. In essence, what is being communicated is this, that the details of a plan, while sometimes seeming somewhat insignificant, may contain hidden problems that threaten the overall feasibility. I want us to come around two parts in our time together today. And the first part is this, that that God works powerfully in the details of life. That God works powerfully or God works sovereignly. That is like extra powerfully in the details of life. We see this and observe this in the first seven verses of Luke's writing here in chapter 2. I'm, I'm kind of a movie buff. I don't know if, if you are, but there is um, a, a movie that I am particularly fond of that I couldn't help but, but think about as I was working through this first part of Luke chapter 2. There's an iconic scene in the film Apollo 13 where Jim Lovell, astronaut Jim Lovell, played by Tom Hanks, is forced to fly what remains of their spacecraft. Running out of fuel oxygen and time, the decision is made to ignite the engine, thus creating needed momentum to return to earth. Now what's interesting about this scene is that it has to be accomplished in a very particular way. It has to be done while keeping the earth in this tiny, tiny triangular window in order to achieve the correct angle for re-entry into the earth's atmosphere ensuring that their craft doesn't break apart or i think as it is described in the movie burnt up this detail though though small is essential 
A miscalculation by a percentage of a degree is the difference between landing safely and missing earth altogether. Through the Old Testament, God has been setting the stage for the arrival of his son. Sharing details that prove to be most important in his identification. This is a matter of the authority and accuracy of God's word. It seems like a small point, but when we step back and we consider what is actually meant by this, at stake is God's very sovereignty. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the prophet writes, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now this is all pertaining to the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the rescuer, the coming of the snake crusher, first foreshadowed to all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 that people have been waiting for anxiously ever since. Behold, Isaiah writes, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel, that is God with us. In Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 6, Isaiah writes this, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7, There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. In Micah chapter 5 verse 2, there is further detail providing insight into the location of the Messiah's birth. As the prophet writes, Bethlehem, you are small among the clans of Judah, but but one will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from eternity. Now, the central theme of this text, that is Luke chapter 2, revolves around the angel's appearance to the shepherds and their proclamation of good news of the arrival of the Christ. But it is interesting that Luke here takes just seven verses to walk through the birth narrative of the Christ, of Jesus, a task described by one commentator as a jewel of economical storytelling. From a pregnant teenage version to an imperial decree, a census, and a geographical shift, Mary and Joseph find themselves in this city instrumental to the redemptive story, all culminating with a birth. You see, Luke is moving us along, and he's doing so quite rapidly at this point. But one question that we are asking as readers is this, how did we get here? Well, let's look back for just a moment. 400 years of silence is is broken. God speaks. Messiah is coming. The circumstances seem really peculiar, but in actuality, they take place at, as Paul describes it in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, just the right time. God does something amazing. He he actually leverages the political institutions of the day to accomplish his purposes in moving Mary and Joseph from Nazareth to Bethlehem, the city that the Messiah was to be born in. The Roman Empire is at the height of their military cultural and economic influence. And as a result, widespread stability is found in the region. For a few decades, there is a type of peace in the area that allows for the movement and growth of Jesus before all of this ultimately collapses in on itself, rise and fall, leading to this realization that only the babe of Bethlehem Jesus, Messiah in a manger, can bring true peace with God and between men. There's a big 
big story being told here. And there's a central theme within this passage. But these first seven verses remind us that the details are very important. After all, this is a a census season. When we consider what's going on historically and contextually at this particular time and place, it's time to count people. Census season is the the means of record keeping, taking place every 14 years, designed to assess taxation and military service. And it just happens, and happens is a very big happens here. It just happens to fall at the end of Mary's pregnancy, requiring this young couple to travel to the city of David. Why? Well, so that the prophecy would be fulfilled the way that God said that it would. The way that he shared and the way that he spoke through the prophet Isaiah, the way that he shared and spoke through the prophet Malachi. Why does this matter? Well, let's break it down into two parts. And we're considering heavily application here. Why does it matter that God orchestrates these details the way that he does leading up to the birth of Jesus? First, the fact that God works in the details of this scene serves to construct confidence in Him. That is confidence in God. These events happen the way that God says that they would, meaning that we can know a number of things. First, we can know this, that Christ's life and death in our place will benefit us now. How can we know that? Well, because God says that it will. God says that there is benefit in this life. That is, as we are engaging with this message right now, that there is benefit in this life, in real time, in real space, in the immediate to Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Well, what does this look like? Well, it looks something like this, right? We can, we can know that the satisfaction that we seek in human relationship, right? The satisfaction that we seek in, in vocation or possession, the joy that you long for, that I long for, that we long for is found in Christ and it's found in Christ alone. How can we know that to be true? Well, because God says in his word that this is true. Human experience speaks towards this, right? We are all, no matter how familiar you are with with the Bible, no matter how familiar you are with these 66 books and their common theme, your experience, your human experience makes it abundantly clear that satisfaction will not be found in the things of this world or a certain position attained or an amount of power achieved. But it's found in something else. We know as Christians, as followers of Jesus, that it's found in Jesus. Because Jesus is born exactly where and how Messiah was said to be born, we can have confidence that these things are true. R.C. Sproul said it like this. He says, if Christ is in me and I am in him, that relationship is not a sometimes experience. The Christian is always in the Lord and the Lord is always in the Christian. And that is always a reason for three letters, one massively important word, joy. Even if the Christian cannot rejoice in his circumstances, which, of course, we know there are seasons in which our circumstances and our joy don't seem to be as tethered as we would desire them to be. If he finds himself passing through pain, which we are all familiar with, sorrow, which we are all familiar with, grief, he still can rejoice in Christ. We still can rejoice in Christ. We rejoice in the Lord. And since he never leaves us or forsakes us, we can rejoice always. Because God works powerfully in the details of Luke 2, we take confidence in his presence with us and what that means for the immediate fulfillment in Jesus in this life. 
Good news, right, is in fact a real thing. There is an immediate benefit because God says that there is an immediate benefit. We can know this to be true. We can know that there is opportunity to take joy. Why? Well, because God says that there is. Because Christ, who comes onto the scene in, in this scene, remains with his people. Right? Those who, who confess him. Those who who look to Him, who embrace Him, who wrap their arms around Him, who see their need, who see sin, their sin, our sin, in light of the the light that God's Word and the Spirit shine on us and, and in us and are left clinging to Jesus. Clinging to Jesus that results in temporal benefit. But not temporal benefit alone. Not only is there an immediate benefit or a temporal benefit, but there is a future element, joy and satisfaction with God extending out of this season and on into, and this is huge. (laughs) This is huge. Extending out of this season, joy here, yes, but joy that extends out on into forever on into eternity because of Jesus's life and death and resurrection death for the Christian has no sting we have been gifted peace we see this as a message from the angels here in Luke chapter 2 We have been gifted peace. Satan is defeated. Our separation with God because of our sin is in fact overcome because Jesus came as God said that he would. And thus we have confidence in his resurrection. And as a result, our future resurrection, the glorified condition of the Christian and the recreation of all things is but a formality. Now, depending on where you find yourself along this plane that we know or refer to as life, that might seem like a very distant hope. For others of us, perhaps it's much nearer. But the reality is this, that it is, it is certain, right? That, that death is the death is certain, right? That, that time is indeed limited. But that because God has worked powerfully in the details of life, glorified condition and a recreation is assured. We can have confidence in this. Why? God's word speaks of these things, right? The book of Revelation provides this beautiful picture of what we can expect as evil is fully and finally judged, as all sad things are made to become untrue. And Christ is reunited in a bodily form with his church, with his people. This is part one. Confidence in God immediately and eternity, eternally. Part two, right? These, these details of Luke 2 are important as God wants you, right? He wants you and he wants me to know that he is in the details of life working to fulfill his mission in and through you and in and through others. Right? There's, a, there's a, a, a benefit element, but then there's also this confidence that's being instilled within, within you and I listening in that God is working in the details of our life to accomplish this larger mission. Here's an example of what this can look like. Right, Courtney and I, as many of you know, have been in the process of moving out of our home that we lived in for five years. We actually closed last last Wednesday. And through the process of, of selling our home and packing up all of our possessions, we were left to spend a lot of time thinking through some of the smaller moments that had 
in turn had this massive impact on us and on others. And so we did this. We, we posted a few pictures on Instagram, which some of you guys maybe have, have seen. And we asked our friends who enjoyed time with us in that house to share some of their memories. And those were all stellar to read. We had comments there. We had comments on Facebook. We had comments come in through text message. We were, we're just a letter shy. We're a regular paper and pencil letter shy of, of the complete process, right? But I want to share with you one text that came through that spoke of some of the joy and some of the experiences that were shared in this home and the impact that they had, that these tiny details had in the lives of other people. Now, all of this is creating, it's constructing confidence from from you and I that God is working in the details of life to accomplish this grander mission. Ultimately, the glorification of Jesus as as more and more people are transformed into his image, gifted faith, and as a result, confessing Christ. This was a text. Let me get to the point, right? This was a text. I'm not going to give any names away here. Robert Moody, uh, who shared this with us this past week. Fall 2016. Me and... Anna Green or Anna Jones at the time were helping you make the video for Gospel Community in the transition phase and Judah was sick. So the video took a long time. I still remember this. Our son Judah has been not sick like hardly ever and this was one time that he was sick and we were in the process of trying to shoot this video to like to to put out. It was kind of a disastrous moment but but again impactful. Let's continue reading through and and exegeting Moody's text. The video was taking a long time. He said, I also made dinner plans in which my girlfriend was picked up by my best friends who she had never met. I got to watch you handle a sick kid for the first time. I saw you laugh and I saw Courtney cry. I enjoyed the company while watching Judah and come and came up incredibly short in a fairly fairly new relationship in a way that my friends still won't let me forget about. Thankful for memories, friends, and immense grace to which we say amen and amen. Now, what's the point here that we're getting to? Because remember, we're, we're just working through the details. We're really talking about the movement of Mary and Joseph out of Nazareth and into this very important city of Bethlehem during this very interesting time and season in history. Here's the point, connecting back to Moody's text here, right? This was a small moment. This was a, a small moment amid a sea of moments. Some which seemed much more important to us than this one. But this was something that God used in a beautiful way. This was something that God used to to, to teach, right? To teach about who He is and the way He cares for us and the way that that following after Jesus and, and believing in the gospel of Jesus transforms the way that we go through any and every situation and circumstance something that God used in a beautiful way. These details are are like this. They're like dealing with sick children around friends, right? They they are like, like simple conversations with your neighbor across the driveway or across the fence. They're these brief moments of of intentionality or genuine interest in the life of the barista at Starbucks. The brief moments, right, in which you have have interaction with a couple of kids whose car break down and you help them push it off of the road, which is a real-life example um, that I was engaged with this past week. And these kids better come to church, right, or at least love and know and worship Jesus as a result. These are, these are conversations and acts of, of grace that are inspired by grace and this unwavering belief that God works in the moments like these. These details shared by Luke, man, they seem unimportant. They seem small, small moments in a sea of moments. But clearly, 
Clearly, these are details that God uses in an incredible way to alter the course of history. You see, we have to get this. Now, we're culminating with this idea, and this is all centering around simple movement. Nazareth, census, no room, babe in Bethlehem, Messiah in a manger. We're all centering on these ideas right here. We have to get this. We have to see. We have to believe, we have to embrace confidence that God is in the details. That God is in the details and that he desires to leverage every one of them. He desires to leverage every detail and every moment of life. What? For his glory. For his glory, no matter how small or insignificant they might seem, leading us to an increased knowledge of Christ. Knowledge that as we survey the remainder of this scene inspires worship. At this point, we have set the stage for the transition into the city. Pick up with me in verse 8. In the same region... Shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Verse 9, Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, Don't be afraid. Look, here it is. I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, today in the city of David, as God is working and orchestrating details to his glory, a Savior was born for you, for you, for the glory of God and for the salvation and rescue of sinners deserving of eternal separation and hostility in terms of human and earthly relationship and interaction, who is Messiah the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You're going to find a baby and he's going to be wrapped up tight in some cloth and he's going to be lying in a manger. This is incredible. Verse 13, suddenly, Right, This very next moment, there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people that he favors. Man, the good news of verse 10 is that Messiah has come. News delivered by an angel to a most unlikely audience. Again, there's a new world tearing through this old one, and we're continuing to unpack and unravel this theme as shepherds become the first recipients of this divine message. There's speculation that shepherds in this region would have been tasked with overseeing the sheep that would have been used for sacrifice. Even still, one would imagine that it would be the priest's or those of a certain elitist background who would have received the news first. Pastors, not barbacks. No, these are the ones that God delivers the message to first. This is the new world, and it results in a very particular, specific response. In verses 15 and 16, we find this, that knowledge of Christ inspires worship in the form of urgency. And so part two is really centering on a knowledge of God that inspires worship. Here, we find this worship resulting in urgency. How do we see that? Look with me at verse 15 as we're kind of winding out some of our time here. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds, they're looking around at one another. Imagine the scene. Imagine these guys out in the field overseeing these, these sheep, maybe these special sheep, like who knows. Um, they're looking around and they say to one another this. Right? This is what they say. Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what's happened. Like, let's go straight there. Like, no, no hanging around, no like diverting, no swinging off, swinging through to check on friends, family on the way. No, straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known, which the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried off and they found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who's lying in the feeding trough. All here it is again, right? We can't escape it just as God had said that it would take place. God makes this incredible news. The arrival of the rescuer. 
known to these societal outcasts, and they respond by leaving, like immediately, to go and find Jesus. Man, one can't help but imagine that like as God's people interacting in various spheres of life that we know those who are not yet following Jesus. Maybe you're watching this, just shared with you, emailed you, whatever that kind of looks like, and you are not following Jesus. I mean, the encouragement would be to, to, to see the goodness of God who sends his son in the form of a, of a baby, right? The son that lays aside, that sets aside certain divine rights in order that he might come and, and, and familiarize himself with our condition. He might, he might, he might familiarize himself with, with pain and hurt and struggle and, and that through pain and hurt, reconcile broken people back to the Father. And all we have to do is look upon him in faith. We turn from our sin and we look to Jesus. These guys leave immediately to find Jesus. To go and to find Jesus. What does that look like for you as you're listening in now? What does that look like for, for you as you are continuing to engage your coworkers with the good news of Jesus? Is there a call to come, to see Jesus, to know Jesus? Man, extend that invitation, man. Invite, come, pray diligently that God would, would do this, that he would make this same news known to these individuals. I know I'm praying that God would make this same news known to you where you are. Knowledge inspires worship in the form of urgency. We see that in verses 15 and 16. In verses 17 through 20, we see this, that knowledge inspires worship in the form of verbal expression. Man, we've been gifted a knowledge of God. We can't help but to share it with other people. That's the result. That is a gospel byproduct. We can say that because we see it here. What do the shepherds do? They go and they report the message that they were told about this child. And the effects of their words are clear. We've talked a lot over the past few weeks about gospel confidence, gospel expectancy. We see a certain element of gospel expectancy and gospel confidence being constructed here in this passage. Verse 18, all who heard the words of the shepherds were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And when we communicate the gospel, when we articulate the gospel, when we verbally express the gospel to other people, there is confidence that God will go about producing a response. That there will be those who say, Man, I'm just not interested, but there will also be those who, who, who see and, and say, Man, we are amazed at what you guys are sharing with us. The Christian's desire, because of the knowledge that we possess, that God has gifted to us, produces humility in us, man. This, is, this produces humility because we say, I mean, we didn't find this on our own. We were staggering around like blind people, feeling. And God opened our eyes. He opened our eyes, and as a result, we are a, a humble people. Our desire, Christians, humble people, is to verbally express to others what we know about Jesus. We express it to others, we pray, and we expect that amazement would, in fact, be an after effect. As with the shepherds, we're encouraged towards eagerness and urgency to go, to see, to share. as we have been gifted the gift of sight. So I want to close with, with this. I want to, I want to close with, with this. I want to ask a, a question. As we consider how Luke would have us to respond to what we see here. I think what Luke would desire, and this is very similar to some things that we've said over recent weeks, is, is this, that we, would, that we would seek Jesus... We would see Jesus and celebrate Jesus, not only at conversion, but in every moment of every day. We made a very similar statement to this just a few weeks ago. We do this in a couple of ways, right? We do it in the Word. 
We do it as we engage God's word, as we, as we open it and we feast on it. And we grow in a knowledge and appreciation of Jesus. When we grow in relationship with Jesus, we do this in prayer. And we do this as we meet with other people who belong to him. And so let's close with this idea. And then I want to read a statement from a book that I enjoyed on the beach this past week. I think there's probably still still sand in this guy falling out on me. I mean, let's be eager and diligent as we grow in an appreciation and celebration of Jesus. Let's be eager and let's be diligent as we grow in a celebration and an appreciation of Jesus. He who is named Jesus, verse 20, the name given to him before he was conceived. From beginning to end, God is working in the details. Let us have confidence that God is working in the details of of our lives. God works in the details. Thus, we can have confidence. We can have confidence that there is real benefit to following Jesus in this life, that there is joy and satisfaction to be found, but it is to be found in Jesus alone, ultimately, right? Let's have confidence in in this, right? That there is an eternal joy that awaits those who look to and trust in Christ, right? That we get eternity and this life in the deal. That is the good news of following after Jesus. We know Jesus, we enjoy benefit and relationship with Jesus, and then we get to be with Jesus forever, and that is really awesome. And then the second part is this, right? The second part is that there is a confidence that you and I possess that God, working in the details of our lives, is moving people towards a knowledge and appreciation of Him as well. That He uses us, and He uses other people to shape us and to form us, as He uses us to shape and to form others. And then lastly, right, we talk about, about ways in which we respond in worship, right? We see that a knowledge from God, of God, inspires worship. Worship in the form of urgency and worship in the form of verbal expression as we look to the shepherds here for a bit of insight. I want to close with a, a, a reading. Um, a reading from J. Kim's book, Analog Church, which is stellar. It's incredible. I'm over my time, but I'm going to share this with you guys and then we're going to round out. I would encourage you to get this. I would encourage you to read this. I think it's really practical. It's really applicable for this season in which we are engaging, even now with so much digital content, to understand the importance of being together with like real people right and what that kind of looks like now he's talking a lot about worship in this chapter um and this is this is what he has to say about worship and again this is tying back with some things that we said a few weeks ago right and it has to do with like our whole body participating in worship i'm going to read to you some of you guys i'm going to lose you at this point um because it's like a paragraph or two or three or seven so but hang with me if you can i think it's worth it in the original hebrew and greek texts of the bible worship explicitly communicates a whole body participation participation in reverent response to God. There's a response, right? There's a response to God, a reverent response, and it is so referred to as worship. Worship implies bowing down, right? Kneeling low with heads on the ground, drawing near and kissing the hand, etc. All acts of adoration and allegiance. All acts that require participation with one's entire body. Rewind, time machine again. You can check this out. We said the same thing like three weeks ago. And so there's a lot of common theme here in the first part of Luke. It's no wonder then that in his letter to the Christians in Rome, Paul instructs us this way. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, your whole bodies, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That comes from Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. The original Greek form uh, of the word bodies here is soma, but there are a variety of Greek words for body. And on, and on a sliding scale, soma covers the most ground and is most comprehensive. It means more than simply physical flesh. And it means more than simply unabodied spirit. The word soma describes both the physical and the spiritual essence of our beings. And it's the word most commonly used to describe the church in the New Testament. Does it get any more analog than this? When we read Romans 12, 1 within the context of Paul's entire letter, it's clear that he's talking about something entirely more holistic than singing a few songs on Sunday. What is worship? What are we observing from the shepherds here? We're getting around some of this. 
Paul says, right? This call to offer our bodies as living sacrifices is a direct response to the acknowledgement that God is at the center of it all. In the passage that precedes this description of true and proper worship, Paul reminds us of these truths. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor, who has ever given to God that God should repay them. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. This is Romans chapter 11, verses 33 and 36. It sounds a lot like what we hear from the angels in this passage. Ponder for a moment. From him and through him and for him are all things. Singing songs is a wonderful expression of worship. Yes and amen. But it is clear that songs alone are not enough. Certainly not when we consider that worship is a response to the vast, incomprehensible idea that all things are from God, through God, and ultimately all things are for God. God sends his son Jesus to save us. For you, this news is being delivered as the message of the angel to the shepherds. For you, he is coming. And it is all ultimately for God, his glory, all things, not just music, not just singing, all things, our time, energy, resources, hearts, minds, bodies. This is worship. So then, Is it any surprise that from beginning to end, the Bible's understanding of worship is whole body participation? If all things are from God and through God and for God, the logical appropriate response would be to give all of ourselves back to him, whole body participation, which acknowledges that none of this is from us. None of this is through us and none of this is for us. God is the centerpiece, the main event, the bottom line, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And as such, he deserves everything we have, not just a few songs, not just our attention for a few brief moments during a sermon, the time that you have engaged this morning, man, but everything, heart, mind, and body. Jesus gives us new minds. The Spirit provides us with a knowledge that results in a giving of ourselves and our everythings to God. And so let's do this. Let's close out our time as we are observing God being given in the form of of Jesus. Jesus who would give himself as the ultimate and final sacrifice to rescue us and to redeem us. Let us pray that through the power of the Spirit as we observe the example of the shepherds here, as we observe ultimately the example of God the Father, God the Son, as we consider the redemptive story that we too would follow suit and that we would give our everything to God in the form of worship. Let's pray and ask God to do this work in us, to inspire this work in us. God, we are grateful for Tom to be engaged in your word. We are grateful for the sending of Jesus. We are grateful for the message of of good news and peace for those in whom you are pleased. We know that we are not naturally pleasing, that we are in need of clinging to Christ, to being cloaked in his righteousness in order to become pleasing, in order to be received, in order to be forgiven. And so we're grateful that you have gifted knowledge, that you you send your son and that his name is Jesus and that you are working in the details of this scene. This instills confidence in us and for us that you are working through the details of our lives for our good, for the good of those around us and all for your glory. Help us to get this so that we too might, as we grow in a knowledge of you and what you are doing and how you are working, give all of ourselves into worship that we might practice urgency, and that we might lean into and offer verbal expression in light of the knowledge that we have received, in light of the grace that we have received. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.